Welcome everyone. My name is Steve Mantis and I am the session lead today um, representing the DWC Steering Committee. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to our session on designing public policy for persons with a disability, the Canada Disability Benefit and Future Options. Uh, it, we're real excited about this. This is timely. The Canada Disability Benefit is in the House of Commons right now. Uh, being debated. Uh, public hearings have just been completed, uh, and we've got some experts to comment on that, and then followed by folks thinking actually beyond that and what else we need. I want to introduce uh, Jonathan Marchand, who will be moderating the session today. Uh, welcome, Jonathan, and over to you. All right. Thank you, Steve. So, yeah, my name is Jonathan Marchand. I'm the person with a uh, disability. Uh, you will learn a bit about me, um, a bit more about me uh, later. Uh, today on this panel, our first two presenters will be John Stapleton and Yvonne Yuan, followed by Michael Kendrick and Bruce Donieti, who I will introduce later. Um, now, uh, John Stapleton is a writer, instructor, and a former innovation fellow with the Metcalf Foundation. He worked for the Ontario government for 28 years in the areas of social assistance policy and operations, and was research director for the task force on modernizing income security for working age adults in Toronto. John teaches on public policy for community advocates and is extensively published in the local and national media. Yvonne Yuan is a public policy analyst at Open Policy Ontario, a social policy consultancy located in Scarborough. She is committed to policy analysis in small geographies and progressive policy advocacy in general. Over the last two years, Yvonne worked extensively on the design of a new Canada Disability Benefit. So over to you, uh, Yvonne and uh, John. Good morning, good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us. No matter which time zone we are in, let's acknowledge that we all live on Indigenous land. Before we start, here's a brief background for our presentation. The proposed Can Canada Disability Benefit, the CDB, intends to supplement working age Canadians with disability. However, until now, we're still unaware of the program's essential details that affect who might be able to receive this benefit, what the amount might be, and how it might fit in with existing programs. With these questions in mind, my colleague and I will be discussing the CDB from a benefit designer perspective, mainly how should a benefit unit be designed? Because of the time limits, we will be going through each slide briefly, and our goal is to invite further discussion. In short, the federal government must solve a contradiction in policy principles respecting the design of the CDB. This dilemma is created by many, by many causes, mainly because of the competing principles in social program purposes, the shifting focuses on meeting family needs and enhancing individual rights, as well as the different definitions of the benefit unit in existing programs. The issues are complicated by multiple systems and roles at all government levels and in the public sector. We present four options in response to, each, to this issue, and we'll discuss each of them in the following step, in the further slides. So um, in short, our recommendation is that the federal government should implement a smart hybrid model incorporating all major features of a single base benefit unit while recognizing elements of family need by harmonizing benefit with, with other disability incomes at the federal, provincial, and territorial levels. So where we are right now, BUC 22, after BUC 35 was called off due to the federal election, election was introduced again in June 2nd, 2022. It is now halfway through the legislature process, but like I said before, we still don't know what, what is the important details of the, event, of the benefit of the program design. We should be noted that there are no changes 
in BOC22 from C35. So the definition, one, one issue uh, relates to the definition of the benefit unit. In terms of the de determination or the definition of the benefit unit, the act states that the government intends to borrow from the experience of seniors and child benefits implying that the benefit unit might be designed in accordance with family needs, in other words, a family-based unit. In the throne speech that first introduced the CBB, it is clearly stated that the federal government intends to follow the model of the Guaranteed Income Supplement, the GIS. However, the federal government also promised to include gender-based plus analysis, the GBA plus, in the department departmental decision-making processes and future planning initiatives. From the perspective of GBA plus analysis, it will require that a new CDB should be available to men and women with disabilities in their own right. In other words, GBA plus is consistent with the individual, a single best benefit unit. The GIS, the model that the federal government intends to follow, on the other hand, has a family-based benefit structure and considers family res resources in the determination of the benefit. Accordingly, a GIS-based Canadian disability benefit design may be seen as contradicting a crucial design parameter central to a GBA plus analysis. We also discussed that there, we also said, stated that there are competing principles underlies the benefit unit determination. In short, the values that guide real world policies in most Western countries relates to our shared heritage, her, heritages, which in Canada are enshrined in Section 7 of the Charter of Rights, life, liberty, and security of the person. Accordingly, there is a strong relationship between democratic principles and how benefit programs define the benefit unit. On the other hand, for low income families, a single benefit unit does not take into account the needs of the recipient's family. It means that if the federal CDB adopts a single benefit unit, income assistance, social assistance, benefit payments, benefit payments would need to be continued for approximately 300,000 low-income children, spouses, and adult children and social assistance across Canada. I now hand it over to my colleague, John Stapleton, to further explain. Thanks very much, Yvonne. And just take a look at this slide. We cannot really get any direction from what we have now. CPP has a single benefit unit along with veterans, but CPP survivors benefits of war veterans give a be benefits to a single person, but then also give some small benefits to spouses and, and other dependents. EI sickness is single, but the Canada Workers Benefit for Disability is a family-based unit. The RDSP is single, the disability tax credit is single, but the GIS that the government says it's going to use from the throne speech is a family-based definition. Personal income taxation is concurrent hybrid. You're single for some purposes, that is when you're taxed, and you're a family for other purposes, i.e. when you're going to get refundable credits. So for the government, it's heads we win and tails you lose. Workers' compensation is a single base, but there's some family support. Ontario Disability Support Program, of course, is a family-based unit, which they are all across Canada, except for Alberta, that has a single-based hybrid in uh, the age program. Disability insurance is family-based. Next slide, please, Yvonne. So when we look at the cost of this, we know that if the government does respect the GBA plus, and remember, we're mostly talking about women here who have lower income, and uh, GBA plus, of course, supports the, the whole idea of someone, uh, of a woman being able to get a benefit in her own right, not being dependent on the income of, of her spouse. So without considering family income, the caseloads of the CDB will increase as the income of spouses would not being taken into account, but we don't have the capacity or the ability to estimate the additional costs in this regard. Next slide, please. So when we try to look at the roles of the federal and provincial territorial government under our constitution, the constitution is clear that the province have enumerated and non-enumerated uh, uh, roles here. And in 1867, there were no income security programs, so we can't really look to the Constitution. Next slide, please. 
And so if we look at existing programs, we look that we have 10 major disability income programs in place, all of which have differing definitions of benefit units. Some are single-based, some are family-based, and they go back and forth, and some of them are hybrid. So decisions as to whether the existing programs should change or rely on the eligibility and the definition of disability and program parameters that will be in place for a new CDB all yet to be made. Next slide, please. So what about existing programs? Should they change or stay the same? So if the CDB acts as a single base benefit top up to a monthly benefit, then all programs could remain the same and income assistance would perform their extended role in meeting family needs. So in other words, we'd have provincial social assistance that would continue to take care of those 300,000 families, uh, uh, spouses. Uh, and then at the same time, we'd have a single base family unit for, for the single person. But however, if a family base unit is chosen, then income assistance as we know it could be folded into the CB, CDB if the benefits are adequate. So again, some will argue for that. But to some, the latter would be a measure of true reform based on anti-poverty principles, while for others favoring the GBA plus analysis, which the government says it's committed to, might be seen as a clear policy law. So we're really on the horns of a dilemma. So 16, the news release clearly said that the CDB would supplement and not replace. So what does that mean? On to 17, thanks. <clears throat> Therefore, if a single benefit unit is adopted for the new CDB, CPPD is largely in accord with the single benefit unit as CPP itself is a single base benefit unit. We don't take into the spouse's income. The spouse could be a millionaire, male or female. However, CPPD and veterans program also provide family-based benefits. It would be a bad design approach to offset family-based benefits against a single base benefit. So in other words, we, we can't, say we're going to take, uh, uh, when the minister says we're going to offset other programs, if we had a single base benefit, we wouldn't want them to offset or claw back the family portion. Accordingly, any spousal benefits paid by CPP and Veterans Affairs should not be offset against the CDB. So that's a consequential amendment there. So the decision, the government of Canada has an important decision to make respecting the benefit unit and can adopt a single benefit unit approach that supports uh, feminist analysis, that supports the GBA plus framework, or it can follow the traditional GIS approach that sees family need as paramount. Made also possible to design a hybrid model, both inside and outside the new CDB. Next slide, please. The smart hybrid model that we're proposing is to have a single base benefit unit. To move people with disabilities out of poverty, the government should implement a smart hybrid program incorporating all major features of a single base benefit unit so that a woman, uh, uh, a spouse would not have to depend on her partner uh, um, this, this is the most important side, while recognizing elements of family need, because we know that people are on income assistance right now and that their spouses and children, we don't simply cut them out of the whole of the things. So the smart hybrid model would keep the family-based benefits for the families where, they're pay, where we're paying now and should adopt an adequate single benefit unit for the new CDB. We have several options and please read through our 70, 70 page slides presentation that goes into this in great detail while utilizing existing social assistance um, and meet the needs of recipients with dependents. So that's it for us. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll turn it back over to Jonathan. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you, uh, John and Yvonne. Uh, now I will tell you a bit more about myself uh, before I introduce the other uh, Panelist, um, I'll share some slides. So, I'm 46 years old. I'm an activist and an advocate for people with um, disabilities. I am a senior network engineer. I work extensively in Quebec and in Australia. I'm a survivor of institutionalization and euthanasia because of the lack of support to live in the community. I need 24-hour assistance around the clock because I use a ventilator to breathe. 
I'm the co-chair of Every Canadian Count, a co-founder of and chair of Co-op Assist, which is a Quebec cooperative for independent living. Now, I spent uh, about 11 years of my life into an institution, uh, a long-term care facility in Quebec. Um, I had to fight very hard to get out of that place. And um, it's actually my, what I experience is what the majority of people with severe disability uh, experience in this country, because there's a lack, a chronic lack of uh, support to live in, in, the, in the community. And just to illustrate how bad it is in those places, uh, you got no cho choice or control over where you live, how you live, and with whom you live in those places. You got no choice uh, or say or who touches your body to provide you the assistance you need to keep, keep on living. You get no next to no family life and uh, you cannot work and invest in your future. Everything is taken away from you, basically. Uh, you're subjected to violence and systemic abuse on a daily basis. You lose your citizenship. You become an object of care and profit. For most, there's no way out of those places. It is really the final destination. And now, sadly, medical assistance in dying is seen as a solution for us. Now, needless to say, uh, I was not having it. I wanted to get out of that place very bad. So I lobbied the government for many years to create a pilot project so that me and others could quit the long-term care facility and live in the community with self-directed personal assistance the government was not uh, hearing us. So during the pandemic, at the peak of the pandemic, uh, about uh, two years and a half ago, I um, went and camped out. I escaped uh, my facility and I camped out in a cage in front of the National Assembly in Quebec, uh, in Quebec City. And I ask the government to uh, hear us and implement a pilot project so that all people with disabilities could one day live freely in the community like every other citizen. I slept in a hospital, in a hospital bed in my cage for five days um, and I spent five nights over there. It was uh, really difficult. I had many people and many friends who helped me out and um, we mobilize around this idea that people with disabilities are just ordinary people, ordinary citizens who want to be included in society. And uh, the media uh, really um, helped push our message out and we were able to um, negotiate with the government for a pilot project. Um, I've been working with the government for uh, quite a while now to get to create something, but sadly, the government um, uh, reneged on their uh, on their the on their promise to create a pilot project. But I managed to get out of that place and to create a precedent because in uh, Codex history, no one has uh, twenty-four hour assistance. Uh, to live in their own apartment. And now I'm helping others get out of the facility and uh, help others uh, avoid the same site. But it's very small scale and it's not recognized yet. So now I live in my own apartment. I work as a network engineer and I have an active social life like everyone else. I got around the clock self-directed personal assistance, and that's what made it possible. I can uh, hire my own assistant. I can choose how the assistance is uh, provided. I can, I got control and choice over my life. But I'm on parole as living in the community with the necessary support is not a right in Canada. It can be taken away from you at any time so the, the work to um, 
cement, what uh, what we achieve is um, is ongoing. Now the Accessibility Act and the Disability Benefit are welcome additions, uh, but it won't it won't enable us to avoid or quit institutions and to leave all citizens included into um, Canadian society. So a national disability insurance program is necessary to address individual individual needs and their families because it's about people with disabilities and their families and we need often extensive support over our lifetime to uh, keep on living in the community. Right now, there's an institutional bias in our system. Most people with severe disabilities end up in institutions because that's where the funding is going. So now I will um, introduce um, Michael and um, Bruce Boniedi and they the got a presentation for us. So, uh, Michael Kendrick is a PhD, um, is a Canadian PhD, uh, independent international consultant in human services, in aging, disability, and mental health in several dozen countries. His involvements and writings include leadership, service quality, the creation of safeguards for vulnerable persons, inten intentional personal networks, social integration, innovation, values, advocacy, the role of alliances, evaluation, alternative to bureaucracy, supported decision-making, personalized approaches to supporting people with complex needs, and reform in the human service field, amongst others. He has independently evaluated many hundreds of services and spoken to tens of thousands of people. And, and Professor Trodos Tonyadi is a disability reformer, economist, one of the key architects of Australia's National Disability Insurance Scheme, the NDIS, and was the in the inaugural chair of the National Disability Insurance Agency from 2013 and 2016. He is currently exec the executive chair and director of the Melbourne Disability Institute at the University of Melbourne and co-chair of independent review of the NDIS. He began his career in the Australian Treasury and as there are many non-executive roles, including President of Philanthropy Australia from 2006 to 2013. He is the father of three adult sons, two of whom have disabilities. So now over to you, Michael and Bruce. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much for that. Um, very warm introduction, and it's terrific to be able to be speak speak to you today um, from Australia about future options uh, for dis you know, for supporting people with disability in Canada. You know, based on our Australian experience, um, Jonathan, your story is immensely moving, and but now in Australia, we're well on the way to having over 500,000 people uh, able to exercise the sort of control and choice that you describe. So if I could just get the next slide, please. So what I'm planning to do today is to give you an overview of the NDIS, its vision, key features, talk to you about some of the reform principles that underpinned its introduction in Australia, why it was needed, the major, give you a brief outline of the Productivity Commission inquiry a decade ago, which led to the scheme, give a brief description of its features, eligibility benefits, the campaign in Australia, which was called Every Australian Counts, and so mirrors your Every Australian Counts campaign, and then talk about the latest data, the review of the NDIS that I'm now co-chairing, and then some concluding remarks. So if we could just go to the next slide. 
The NDIS is a world leading reform and it's truly unique in the in the way it frames disability in an insurance investment and economic framework. It's not just a social policy reform. And as emphasized by Jonathan, what it gives to people with disability is control and choice uh, over their lives. And at the same time seeks to build the capacity of communities. And because it's being developed uh, in an insurance framework, we are collect now collecting the best data on disability uh, anywhere in the world. And we're now starting to use that data to refine and improve the scheme and through the review uh, that I'm now co-chairing. So if we could just go to the next slide. Key to the NDIS is its underlying principles. So it is based on human rights and the UN Convention of Rights of Persons with Disability to participate uh, in society. It's designed to be equitable and fair. So supports are based on need. So someone like Jonathan, who's got high support needs, gets a much higher package than someone with lower support needs. It's designed to be effective, efficient, empower people with disability, build family, social and community capital, to be sustainable from a budgetary or fiscal policy perspective, and to ensure that it is always supported by the community, which it is in Australia. This is now by this is now supported by all political parties and at all levels of government. And then finally, it's designed to fit in to our it was designed to fit into our existing policy uh, and government uh, structures. So if I could just go to the next slide. The reason we needed an NDIS uh, in Canada was that we recognised through a pension review in 2008 that pensions and benefits are insufficient to meet the lifetime needs of people with disability, especially those with very high support needs. So in Australia, our NDIS sits above or is in addition to our equivalent of your disability benefit. In Australia, we call that the disability support pension. The second uh, need was that people uh, with disability, uh, support needs of people with disability have been rising due to some very powerful demographic forces. People with disability were living much longer and uh, generally outliving their parents due to better medical treatments. At the same time, the capacity of families to provide informal care was declining due to increasing female participation, smaller and more dispersed families, and increased marital breakdowns, especially in families uh, with disabled children. Prior to the introduction uh, of the NDIS, the support system for people with disability was literally uh, in crisis, increasingly focused more and more on those people in crisis as their family supports uh, disappeared. And the Productivity Commission in its report a decade ago described our system as in a death spiral. And I would argue that support systems around the world, including in Canada, are also facing a very similar crisis to the one we faced in Australia. So the next slide, please. So the Productivity Commission in its report described our then system as underfunded, unfair, fragmented, and inefficient. And so recommended the introduction of the NDIS and noted that it would add significantly to GDP. The other point to note was there was a report, an OECD report at about the same time, which found that 45% of Australians were living at or below the poverty line, which is the worst of any OECD country. So the NDIS is help is partly designed to lift people with disability uh, and their families uh, out of poverty. And it's meant to be, or is designed to be, uh, a major source of improved equity and fairness uh, in our society. So to the next slide. So who's eligible for the NDIS? It's all Australian citizens under the age of 65 who have a significant 
and permanent disability. It includes people with intellectual, physical, sensory and psychosocial disabilities and also provides early intervention for children with significant development delay. And it, all of this is based on a functional assessment rather than medical diagnosis. And that, of course, is a much fairer way of determining need than a single medical diagnosis. Next slide, please. So the NDIS provides reasonable and necessary supports. It includes core supports uh, to support activities uh, of daily living. It actually provides uh, capacity building, so invests in people with disability to uh, improve their function, to enable them to participate in society, and also includes uh, equipment uh, such as wheelchairs. The, benef uh, the benefits therefore help to su uh, support people with disability uh, in their daily activities, accessing the community. And participants receive the funds so that they can purchase uh, their support, so they are free to choose. And as I've mentioned, it works alongside our disability support pension, which is the uh, equivalent of your Canadian disability benefit. The insurance-based approach seeks to maximise the lifetime uh, opportunities of people with disability, to enable people to work like Jonathan's described, and to minimise their lifetime costs. It is, in fact, from an economic perspective, the most efficient and effective way of supporting people with disability, and all within a vision to maximise independence and social and economic participation. So next slide, please. So as part of the scheme, we do measure outcomes across uh, the eight domains listed there. And the outcomes are measured not just for participants, but also uh, for the families. And this is so it is really structured uh, as an investment scheme, not just uh, as uh, a welfare scheme. So going to the next slide. The NDIS came about not due primarily to governments, but due to a community campaign called Every Australian Counts. The, the campaign, and I salute the campaign that you're running in Canada, is testament to the power of individuals to change society. So the Australian experience demonstrates that what you are trying to achieve can also uh, can actually be done. And the key uh, elements of our campaign were, first of all, achieving unity amongst people with disability, carers and service providers for the NDIS. Our selection of language was very uh, important. It framed, uh, uh, so it described the old disability system uh, as broken. And once that was accepted, then reform uh, had to come. And the campaign name, which uh, you've also chosen, evokes images of people with disability not counting. They need to be counted and are seen to be counted. And finally, uh, the thirdly, we used economic analysis as the principal framework for uh, advocating uh, for the scheme, not just uh, a social, we didn't frame it just as a social policy issue or a human rights issue, we framed it as an economic issue. And in Australia, at least, most public policies are importantly shaped by their economic uh, consequences. And then finally, we use technology and social media to link people up right across Australia in support of this scheme. And at critical times, there were emails, there were text messages being sent to our uh, Prime Minister, to the leaders of our uh, states, which are the equivalent of your provinces, to ensure that this scheme was introduced. Next slide, please. 
In Australia, uh, people with disability are underrepresented uh, in our workforce. There are 2.1 million people uh, with disability of working age, which is 12% of Australia's working age population. But when you look at their employment experience, it's very different uh, to those uh, without disability, with um, employment rates and labour force participation rates lagging 30% behind uh, the Australians without disability. And this gap has in fact widened over the last uh, couple, couple of decades. The, in the 2010 study that I referred to earlier from the OECD, ranked Australia in the bottom one third of OECD countries in terms of employment with disability. And I note that Canada uh, is at a similar level uh, to Australia. So there's an enormous opportunity through uh, the NDIS in Australia to improve employment outcomes for people with disability, which is not just good for them, but it's actually good for society, as Jonathan has demonstrated uh, in his personal story. So let me now go to the next slide, which just gives you a few key statistics on the NDIS. As I said, there are more than half a million participants in the scheme. 334,000 of them are receiving support for the first time. So it indicate, gives you some indication of how needed this scheme was in, in Australia, how hidden uh, disability uh, was. Um, since the scheme began, there's been significant increases in social participation, uh, in employment uh, of uh, people with disability, uh, in improved employment outcomes uh, for parents, uh, and um, also in improved health uh, and well-being. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, we now have an independent review of the NDIS underway. It's nearly 10 years since the scheme began, and well, as well as being transformational, the scheme has been disruptive. We've now got an enormous amount of data on which we can assess the effectiveness of the scheme, and that's what the review um, that I'm co-chairing uh, is designed to do. We report directly to the, uh, the Minister for Disability in our um, federal government, but we also report to disability ministers uh, in our state governments. The review is focusing on the issues listed there, the participant experience, improving the scheme's effectiveness and sustainability, attracting, building and retaining a capable workforce. Disability care and aged care is now the largest uh, workforce sector uh, in Australia and has grown very significantly uh, due to the NDIS. We're also working on improving consumer information and deepening the markets that have emerged since the NDIS commenced, improving quality and safeguards and ultimately improving outcomes for participants and their families, including uh, social and economic uh, participation. Uh, just go to the next slide. Um, the NDIS is a nation building uh, reform. It was led uh, by people with disabilities uh, and their families. It was a response to a perfect storm and a perfect storm that I think uh, is clearly developing uh, in other Western countries, uh, including in Canada. It's also more than a social reform because it reframes disability as a central economic and policy challenge for all governments. And today we stand in a position where the NDIS has the potential to be at the heart of the best disability system in the world, which embraces disability rights. Uh, and this is the aim of the NDIS review, which is underway. 
our experience is that only an individualized scheme like the NDIS based on a social insurance model can provide the supports which are necessary for those who experience significant lifetime disabilities and so can support optimal lifetime outcomes in terms of economic and social participation. And just to answer Steve's question that was in the chat, it is essentially an individual benefit but it then does take account of the capacity of families to provide informal care. And so, and so, in a, so recognises that a quality life is not just based uh, on government benefits. A quality life is based on loving relationships, on friendships, and also on sufficient benefits. So I would argue it is primarily an individual benefit scheme but with an allowance for families to play a part of, in the lives of those of the participants uh, within the scheme. So thank you very much. I look forward to participating in the Q&A. Thank you, Bruce. Now, um, Michael. Now, um... The example from Australia shows that we've had significant progress in the last several generations throughout the world on improving the life conditions of persons with disabilities in almost all countries. Um, and uh, many of those opportunities and innovations could occur in Canada or have already occurred in Canada. And so Canadians are aware of uh, these progressive developments or could become aware of it. So it's important to, that people do understand that it is possible to make progress. Uh, next slide. Uh, now, just in the Canadian context, just to, to indicate that there has been actual progress in Canada in terms of overall social inclusion of persons with disabilities within their communities. Uh, this has included uh, a greater participation in community generally across the country. Uh, and uh, there's a, a growing interest in looking uh, to even yet more progress in Canada. And hence, it brings us to the moment we're in right now where we're looking around for uh, the, to answer the question, uh, how to build on the progress that's been made and to uh, see if we can advance it yet further. Next slide. Uh, in Canada, like in many countries, a lot of this has been generated bottom up from uh, initiatives in the various provinces at a community level and provincial level. Um, and this does indicate that there's a strong commitment in Canada for progress uh, in terms of the lives of persons with disabilities. Uh, and uh, it is, in a sense, not a new thing. It's trying to build upon what's already been uh, created that's been helpful. But the clear implication is that there's still yet much to be done in Canada that we're not yet attempting. Next. Uh, now, the provincial and local governments uh, often dominate uh, the uh, support for people with disabilities, much like the, that was the case in Australia. Uh, but there, it does highlight that there, at, in this respect, Canada needs uh, a new wave of federal or national uh, leadership if we we're to uh, make the kind of progress that's been made in countries such as Australia. So that's why we're focusing really on the uh, where the uh, way forward may be at the federal level. Next. Um, and as uh, Bruce has been describing, the National Disability Insurance Scheme uh, uh, was, uh, if you like, kind of created uh, from scratch. It wasn't uh, in place as it is uh, today. It blended with what was already on the ground, but it did break new ground in important ways. So a similar question uh, exists at the national level in Canada. Uh, where the federal government hasn't uh, thus far provided all of the leadership it can provide from that level. And similarly, at a local and provincial level, there's still many un, uh, unfulfilled uh, sort of potentials. 
But today we're focusing a little bit on the uh, federal or national uh, potentials. Next uh, slide. Now, whatever the merits and limitations of the Australian NDIS, and uh, people in Australia would say that it's a wonderful initiative, uh, but they too are always looking for the question of how it might be improved. Uh, and uh, in Canada, it's pretty obvious that depending on where you are in Canada, uh, you may get a better or worse form of support from your government, your provincial government, so that in this sense, uh, not all Canadians are equal. It, a lot depends on the province you're in and what that province has to offer. Hence, like in Australia, which also had a state-based system prior to NDIS, uh, we're really needing to look at so what could be created in Canada that might be inspired by the NDIS that would be a made in Canada version of it but that uh, would have the effect of leveling the playing field for all people with disabilities across Canada uh, to move ahead uh, in common, uh, no matter where you live in the country. Next. Uh, uh, so there is uh, then a role for the Canadian national government and it will, to move ahead, it needs to have some kind of consensus uh, from across Canada as to what should the future look like, uh, what could we borrow from Australia and other countries, uh, as well as build upon what's already in place in the country. So the uh, Australian Federal Innovation, uh, which had a very good name, uh, that uh, Aus every Australian counts, uh, this we could mimic ourselves by saying that every Canadian counts, and so we can't have benefits in one province that aren't available in another. Otherwise, obviously not every Canadian counts. And next slide. Now, there is a considerable potential to make such an effort at equity, fairness, and leadership a priority of both the Canadian and provincial federal governments. Uh, the cooperation between federal and provincial governments is not unknown, but it's certainly, uh, uh, need to strengthen it at this point if we're going to make these kinds of uh, uh, progress. So uh, the Every Canadian Counts uh, sort of initiative then uh, would be the basis for trying to work out what this uh, national model would look like. Much like in Australia, they didn't start with a known answer. They had to uh, create it and to uh, appraise different ways to think about it and to move ahead. Uh, but uh, in the end, they did make enormous progress and continues to do that. So I think that's a very inspiring role model for us in Canada. Well, thank you, Michael. 